here we are in Genesis chapter 17. Is that right or 16? 17. 17, yeah. Yeah, 17. Okay. I forgot to put it at the top of the frame here. I was lost for a sec. Okay, so um, Genesis chapter 17. This is also, I, I think mm -hmm. that the... There's so much here that is, I would consider to be of great, great significance between chapters 15 and 19 or even all the way up to chapter 22. There's just so much powerful material and here we are again in some really spiritual, powerful material. So uh, we're going to tackle this as well as we might. There's going to be a lot left undone, I can tell you that for sure, but let's just do what we can do. So here we go, Genesis chapter 17. And it came to be when Abram was 99 years old that Yuvah appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect. And I give my covenant between me and you and shall greatly increase you. And Abram fell on his face and Elohim spoke with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall become a father of many nations. And no longer is your name called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, because I shall make you a father of many nations, and I shall make you exceedingly fruitful, and make nations of you, and kings <clears throat> shall come from you. And I shall establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to, the, to you and to your seed after you. And I shall give to you and your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession. And I shall be their God. And Elohim said to Abram, As for you, guard my covenant, you and your seed after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you guard between me and you and your seed after you. Every male child among you is to be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall become a sign of the covenant between me and you. And a son of eight days is circumcised by you. Every male child in your generations he who is born in your house or redeemed with silver from, from any foreigner who is not of your seed, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money or redeemed has to be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And an uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, his life shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And Elohim said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, do not call her name Sarai, for Sarah is her name. And I shall bless her, and also give you a son by her. And I shall bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples are to be from her. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and said in his heart, is a child born to a man who is a hundred years old? Or is Sarah, who is ninety years old, to bear a child? And Abraham said to Elohim, Oh, let Ishmael live before you. And Elohim said, Nevertheless, Sarah, your wife, is truly bearing a son to you, and you shall call his name Yitzchak. And I shall establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I shall bless him and shall make him fruitful and greatly increase him. He is to bring forth twelve princes and I shall make him a great nation. But my covenant I establish with Yitzchak, whom Sarah is to bear to you at this appointed time next year. And when he had ended speaking with him, Elohim went up from Abraham. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all those born in his house, and all those redeemed with his silver, 
every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that same day, as Elohim had told him. And Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised that same day. And all the men of his house, born in the house or redeemed with silver from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Now, that's uh, quite a bit going on there. And I want to just touch on some things. Remember again that 13 years have passed since God last spoke to Abram. And it is likely that Abram and Sarai, after the, Ish, the Ishmael and the Hagar situation kind of simmered down and things maybe got into a comfortable rhythm, that uh, Sarah and Hagar and, and uh, well, at least probably Abraham and Sarah had probably every expectation and, and understanding and belief that, that Ishmael was the chosen seed, that they, they weren't expecting anything different. They thought, well, this didn't turn out awesome. There was a little bit of confusion and some trouble here at the beginning, but Hagar is still with them. Mm -hmm. The son is still with them. He's 13 years old. Things have been trucking along. It doesn't say it's been all turbulent. Maybe there was some turbulence in the household with the women, but they probably have every reason to believe that the, uh, Ishmael is the chosen son, and uh, they wouldn't have any reason to believe otherwise mm -hmm. until bam, here it is, you know, that, that no, it's not Yitzhak. Uh, it's not uh, Ishmael, it's Yitzhak. Um, so I want to focus just briefly on, uh, you know, just bringing that to your attention, that more time has passed and that they, are, they thought that maybe this program was being fulfilled through um, Ishmael, but that it was not. And here God appears and identifies himself as... El Shaddai, and I have, you can see, underlined certain words and phrases <coughs> in this passage, with I, which I, we're going to focus on here and there, which are, are really crucial to understanding, I think, in this passage. And it starts with El Shaddai. This is the, the first time in the Torah that this, this epithet is used to describe God. Now, what is your understanding regarding El Shaddai? What does that mean? God Almighty. God Almighty is the most common translation. Why do you think that God would suddenly pop up and say, I am El Shaddai? <laughs> I mean, he's been calling himself uh, well, he hasn't really been calling himself anything, frankly. That Moses has been identifying him as either Elohim or Yehovah. Mm -hmm. um, we saw when he was when he when Abraham met with uh, Melchizedek that it was uh, God Most High, you know, the, the the Lord of Heaven and Earth. But here, God gives Himself a nickname, if you want to put it that way, and He says, "I am El Shaddai." Bless you. Thanks. So. You know, there's some interesting things regarding this name El Shaddai. Your, most of your text will say that El Shaddai is most often rendered as God Almighty, and almost all texts will do that. Um, but it's probably best translated as the sufficient one, based on, on the way that you can um, interpret these, these, the, the, maybe the root and the base of this word Shaddai, which is frankly a little bit confusing because there's no precedent for it. Mm -hmm. This word Shaddai. Do you know of, uh, I mean, looking at it, uh, are you familiar with anything that how you might be able to break up or maybe see some other word that might be a part of Shaddai? Do you recognize anything in there? You might not, but I just thought I'd ask. Anybody? Only L. Yeah, L is L just God. Yeah, that's shortened form of the of, of God or Lord or Judge. So, Emmanuel. yeah, Emmanuel is with us. Yeah. God with yeah. us. Yeah. Tracy. Um, the word Sadeh is field or land. Okay. 
That's an interesting one. It's still the same one. way it should have. Okay. So, and yeah. a lot of the places where it's much more used, it's talking about uh, El Shaddai blessing somebody or making them fruitful. Right. Right. Yep. That's a good one. That's a good one. You know, some have um, rendered. You know, what's interesting is Shin, who is Dainu. Shin Dainu. Shaddai is, is, is kind of a potential potential root here. You ever heard Dainu? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dai Dainu. <laughs> it means it would have been enough. It would have been enough if you had you know, redeemed us out of Egypt. It would have been enough if you had brought us through the Red Sea. It would have been enough if you just fed us manna. You know, it's like, but you did this. It would have been enough if you had just done that, but then you did this. So it's like Dainu, that some uh, Hebrew scholars have suggested that um, that's why that it's sometimes translated as the sufficient one, because they're to kind of going off of that Dainu phrase. Uh, shai, Shin Dainu, the one who is sufficient or it would have been enough or sufficient. So that's one potential translation. Uh, it may also be related to the, wor- to the Hebrew word shad. Do you know what the Hebrew word shad is? It's a woman's breast. Hmm. And you could l- ch- technically render this as the, the breasted one. Now that is obviously not a very popular translation of El Shaddai. But what might what might the implications of that be, if they're not obvious? I mean, a, a breast of nursing mother. He holds you to his bosom. He holds you to his bosom, and just like a nursing mother, you know, a mother's milk is all sufficient. Mm-hmm. I mean, it provides everything perfect. that you need. It's perfect. It's the perfect sustenance and answer to everything that a baby needs. So I think that either. Shin Dainu as the God who is sufficient, or the breast of the mother's milk is rather intimate, but really a, a striking representation of just how sufficient and all encompassing God is. And so I think why it. Now, some have also suggested that it might be Shaddad, which really is kind of strange because that means like the destroyer. I'm <laughs> like, that doesn't seem to fit the context exactly. No. Keith? Well, if you take the shin and then put the door next to it, so you've got that consuming, and sometimes, you know, I've seen the, the, the shin represent not only the teeth, but fire or something that destroys. Both of them consume, the yeah. You don't make it through the door. He guards the door, and if you're not worthy, then you're not going to make it through the door because you're not yeah. going to get past that fire. That's a good point. And That's a good point. You'll be destroyed by fire. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Angela? That kind of goes with what I was, the problem I was having with hay. How so? This double, it, good and bad. Yeah. That's how yeah. all Hebrew is, right. pretty much. It's true. Yeah, it's there's, true. It's a, there's a double meaning, and I think that's right. exactly what Paul's saying when he says to rightly divide the word of truth. Right. Because you can look at it this way, or you can look at it this way, right. or it could mean this, or it could mean this. It's and it probably means sword. both it's in a, a lot of cases. Sword. Yeah. Yeah. So there's two sides. Right. And, and I, I think it very well could mean both. It, it certainly could, yeah. yeah. In the in yes. the context that we're looking at here exactly. where where God is appearing to Abram and making great promises and promising him all of these wonderful things, is he do you think that God's saying I am the destroyer or I am the one who is sufficient and will cover everything? Keith? Well, I think God finds pleasure when you fear him. Okay? You're supposed to fear the Lord. And then he knows you understand who is your creator and who yeah. made things. I don't think he wants you to see him as your destroyer. No, exactly. But you you do understand that, I guess, what the word is a destroyer. about what the, the end is about. You know, sure. you're seeing forward that if you do not follow his ways... That's a good then, insight. ...then you should be fearing what the... Yeah. Destruction to come. That was a good insight. Carla, I believe that you're timidly raising your hand. Yeah. No, I just thought that um, with the use of El Shaddai, it, it was like, I, I'm i your provider, your sustenance, everything you need. And 
and it's kind of like the child that is fed. So it's that perspective of him being um, the father yeah. to the child, and we are children of God. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of see it like that. Too. Sure, sure, absolutely. And I think it it really plays up to the idea that we want to make sure that we get everything we need from God. Well, better yet, maybe we don't realize it, but we do get everything from yeah. God. And maybe that's the point, is we need to realize that everything we get comes from God. Angela and then Tracy. Um, going off of what Carla said and what you said about it possibly being the breasted one, mm-hmm. when you think about a mother, Yeah. I mean, there's the mother that's providing for a child, and then there's the phrase, mama bear. <laughs> yeah, that's and true. You could say that's a double meaning, but yeah. I'll tell you what, I can be a mama bear <laughs> for my kids, a destroyer for, for my cubs. The destroyer yeah. of worlds, yeah. yes. I got gotcha. you. So I see how it can be both. Sure, absolutely. Tracy? Um, I was just looking at a few scriptures, like Mike had mentioned, that when El Shaddai is used, it's often in regards to being fruitful, and it is right here as well. Yeah. And just I just pulled three that I saw, and they were all about saying something about being fruitful. Mm-hmm. And that's interesting if this word Shaddai is related to a field or land or cultivated field, because that's what we are supposed to be you know, representing is this fruit-producing tree in sure. the earth. Yeah. You know? So it's kind of like... There's some kind of connection there with being fruitful and multiplying, and, and totally. his name. What 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 names he chooses in different situations, I think, are very, very important. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. I think it is very cool, very cool. Oh, and I also want to say regarding like the words, like like she was saying, like some things mean two do- opposites, and that's it's very true. Like I could give you a few off the top of my head, but. Um, Melissa Aylmine talked about one in English to kind of give us an idea of like because there's really no, we don't have that kind of vocabulary in English, but the one word that she used was cleave. That could be cleave to cling or cleave to cut in half. So it's like the same word means the two separate things. That's how Hebrew is a lot. Right. There's a lot of things. Like the word, we'll see, like the word kodesh. Right. The same spelling also means male prostitute. So you're either holy or you're a male prostitute. So it's like, okay, holy opposite, spelled the same. Well, I think that's uh, really interesting that you mentioned Halissa Aylwine, too, because she's one of the ones who really talks about these chiasms or uh, menorah patterns. Some people call them menorah patterns. When you look at a Hebrew word that seems to have opposite meanings, they're still very closely related, and it's a balancing concept uh, that you really can see in Hebrew when they have these words which mean have multiple meanings even if there's multiple meanings, they all seem to be tied together in some way. There's like this center sticking point that they all kind of feed from, and they have something related. There's something related to them, you know, to make them more unified. Even though they might be completely separate concepts, there's somehow some unified idea or theme. But I think it would, and these are excellent insights, I think that all of these different interpretations and translations of the word El Shaddai are very applicable and it really does tell us something about God but most importantly I think it not only tells us something about God but something about how we need to perceive our relationship with God as the one who judges the one who is all-sufficient a fruitful field who you get sustenance from a mother's milk then from the breast that is all-sufficient for you Uh, and I think that he needs to reassure Abraham at this point. I mean, Abraham is now 99 years old. He thinks he's got the promises are set in motion. He's got uh, Ishmael. Things seem to be going okay. He's like, no, I'm still promising you much, much greater things than you hadn't even imagined. And I need to reinforce to you that I am El Shaddai, the one who is able to provide everything. And that is such a hard concept for us to get. We, we, are, we become very self-sufficient. And that is, you know, that some of it is intrinsic in our human nature, which is part of our uh, yetzer hara, or our evil inclination, or our, if you want to call it a sin nature, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, being self-sufficient is something that comes intrinsic to us. But and, uh, and also in our own culture, you know, the Protestant work ethic and, and, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, work hard and you can achieve uh, what you want in life. Those kind of principles and precepts have been, you know, pounded into us 
uh, in, our, in Western culture so that we believe very strongly in our own capabilities and in our own abilities to work hard and, and believe me, I don't want to take away from working hard and being diligent and, and doing what needs to be done, but I think we, we lose sight of where does the blessing come from? Is it a result of my own hard work? Or is it a result of him being able to, to more easily steer a moving car? You ever tried steering a car that's not going anywhere? <laughs> that doesn't work very well. So I think that our own efforts and our own work get the car moving a little bit, and then he can easier point us in the direction and move us if we're willing to listen and find out where he wants us to go and what he wants us to do. And I'm not talking about asking him which leg of your pants to put on first. I'm just talking about things in life that he needs to be consulted and we need to seek for his will. And I think many of us have lost that. We become self-sufficient and not looking at him as El Shaddai, the sufficient one. We become very self-sufficient. Well, uh, even just being uh, grateful for the blessing to be able to work hard. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. We don't necessarily have to take credit for, I did this, but thank you for giving me the strength yeah. to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for making me alive right. each day. Thank you for giving me at least enough health to get out of bed and go to my job and do the things I need to do. Thank you for, you know, it's not for no reason that you got that job. You know, God wanted you to have that job. He's placed you where you are. Now be faithful where you are. And when he wants you to go somewhere else, he'll open up the door to go to that next place. So uh, we just need to remember that he is absolutely sufficient and that we need to trust in him and look to him for everything and not be self-sufficient in spite of the fact that that's what our culture pushes on us a lot. Um, so now, what the next thing is that he, after identifying himself as the sufficient one, he then gives instruction. Walk before me and be perfect. Now, we'll talk about that word perfect in just a second. And I think we have already discussed briefly, walk before me. Um, we did discuss that when we talked about Enoch, who was walking with God. You remember the difference when we talked about that? When, when Noah walked with God, Enoch walked with God, and Abraham walks before God. Do you remember the difference? We kind of had a little, we used a couple of little metaphors to say, you know, if your child is young and immature and not quite of a age to be terribly responsible, you got to hold the hand of that child. And you got, when you're walking, you go for a walk through the neighborhood, you don't have your three-year-old walking ahead of you. That's dangerous, you know. You keep that child in hand or on a leash, <laughs> which has become a popular thing. I think I've always thought that was hilarious to see a child on a leash. But Abraham is instructed, and it is later um, spoken of regarding Abraham that he walked before God. And that is a, a certain level of maturity, which indicates that he knows the will of God well enough and is walking the will of God well enough that he is able to go out just a little bit ahead, but not so far as that he can't hear the word of God behind him, steering him, giving him direction, telling him which way to go. I think that speaks of a mark of maturity. If you, uh, Tracy? I'd like to propose another way of possibly looking at that. Please. Before me. Mm -hmm. In the Hebrew, it's lamed pani, which is walk to my face. Mm. So I was thinking about this, like, I just thought it was really cool because it's like, when you repent, what are you doing? You're turning from your sin and you're walking to God. Mm. Walk to me and be perfect. May his face shine upon you. And that word shine is or light. So it's right. like you're walking to the light. Yeah. So that's really, really a neat concept. Absolutely. Like you're walking and being perfect as he is perfect. You know, yeah. You're walking in that, sure. that path. You're walking. And the, the word is a lamp. It is a light. Right. You know, uh, that's that's a, that's an interesting concept. I like that one. I like that one. That's also very too, cool. You know, this mirror. You're, you're probably going to say this. I'm sorry, but um, when Messiah says, "Be perfect for your, as your Father in heaven is perfect," and that's mm -hmm. how he ends chapter five of Matthew, which is all right. about blessed for this, blessed for that. 
I came to fulfill the Torah. Yeah. Let your light shine. Right. You know, it's all this stuff. It's, this is how you be perfect. Yeah, and, and I was, I, you know, I was going to bring that up here, <clears throat> and I will in, in just a couple of minutes um, regarding James says the same thing, and we've talked about this many times. It's that the book of James is, is an entirely, the book of James is a commentary on Matthew 5 through 7. So it talks about the same things. I like your idea about you know turning towards the face of God, uh, so that His His countenance will shine upon you. You know, one thing that when I was looking at this, uh, you know, walk before me, it kind of led me to this this picture in my mind. Uh, that it's not totally fitting, but it kind of is. Imagine, if you will, and you might have seen this in a movie or something, or maybe even read about it, but it was common, like, for the example, when um, Caesar came from Gaul, after, after defeating the, uh, the Gauls, came back to the city of Rome. And he's uh, doing his, pri his triumphal entry into the city. He is on a fancy chariot, and he's, you know, got his two or three, you know, war generals behind him as he's coming into the city. But in front of him is a whole slew of people. There are um, exotic animals which he has captured on his journeys. There are slaves, there are musicians and, and music players, there are jugglers, and why wouldn't a king or the Caesar of Rome go at the head of the procession with all of the fancy stuff behind him? Why would he put a bunch of fancy stuff ahead of him Instead, or maybe like even a, a parade that you see going through a small town or something. The most important person is not at the head of the parade. They're in the middle of the parade. And every, all this other stuff is going on in front of them. Why is that, do you think? And how might that apply here? Because that's the picture that I had in my mind. And I'm not saying it's totally you know, working in this case, but it just made me think of something. That when a king has a procession that is going before him. They're not chosen at random. These, these people, these creatures, these soldiers are there to go in front of the king or the Caesar or the most important person in the parade to give a demonstration of this person's character, this person's power, this person's authority. If you've got all these soldiers walking before the Caesar, and a bunch of slaves, and a bunch of exotic creatures that he's captured while he's been on his travels, and a bunch of people who are performing feats, and uh, criers who are blowing trumpets and stuff. What are they doing? They're really heralding the majesty of this person who is coming after them. And in that sense, it made me think of Abraham walking before God, being like a herald mm -hmm. for God, and saying, I... I trust you well enough. You are a faithful servant of mine who is going to walk before me and herald my presence in this earth. That's kind of like what they were doing when Messiah came in. The Waving palm branches. palm branches and stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to look at it. So I thought that that might be applicable. Now as far as this thing, this segment here called, you know, saying, he says, walk before me and be perfect. Well, that's a, that's a tall order. That is a tall order. And, you know, you mentioned Matthew, you know, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And in the book of James, right at the beginning, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So here we have this admonition from God to uh, you know Abraham and from the Messiah Yeshua to his disciples and James teaching about that same thing to be perfect. What does that mean to you? Tamim. We're looking at the Hebrew word tamim. What does it mean? Oh, Mike, John. I was just going to say it's the mo it's used the most as like without blemish. Unblemished. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah. So well, how would you, what would the implication be? I mean, what does that mean for us? How, how, what does it mean to be unblemished? Undefiled. To Undefiled. To walk in the Torah of Yahweh. Yeah. To walk in the Torah, yeah. That, you know, that reminds me again of the book of James where he says this is undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father, to visit widows and orphans in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. That's the hard part. You'll notice he put that at the end there. You know, taking care of widows and orphans, 
That's something that we can do. Keeping yourself unstained by the world, being tamim, not being unblemished, uh, without spot, wrinkle, that's tough. And he is admonishing Abraham to do that. Um, that one truth is also in that definition. Emet, the Hebrew um, word you mean? It, it's one of the synonyms for ta tamim. Oh, truth. okay, yeah. Excellent. Tracy? That's the first verse of Psalm 119. It's 119 is, Blessed are the undefiled, the tamim, mm -hmm. in the way, the ref, right. who walk in the Torah of Yahweh. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You so, think, by the way, the, the, uh, that it is also a little bit of warning from what he did before with, uh, with Hagar. Well, he didn't really listen. Maybe he didn't understand fully. We talked mm -hmm, about it mm -hmm, last week. Right. Kind of from, hey, from now on. Pay attention. Don't pay do anything attention. without talking to me first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good idea. And I think you, you could be right. Uh, it might be part admonition. I would assume that it probably is. So pay attention to how you're walking because you're going to be walking before me as my representative. Pay attention. Be and blameless. Be an example. Be an example. Yeah. Don't make stupid decisions. This is a really cool image to me. We've got the olive in the top, the first and the last letters of the alphabet. I am the olive in the top, the first and the last. A picture of the father, a picture of the son. And in the wilderness, one went, a cloud went before them and one went behind us. You've got this like, mm -hmm. leading and, and guiding from behind. And in the, I think it's Isaiah that says, your, ears will, your eyes will see your teacher and your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way walk in it. So my teacher is Yahushua Messiah, he's my rabbi. And he's back here at the end. My father's here at the, and he's saying, walk to my face. And my, my teacher's saying, go this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just give me goosebumps. <laughs> I'm walking this, there's one, this is the way. And he's coming back to make sure that you're, you're walking in, the, in that. Mm -hmm. And that path toward, back toward the Father. Excellent insight. Excellent insight. I like that a lot. That's very cool. Um, let's briefly review. We've got two sides. Uh, this is, and, I, and I, I think we, you know, when we talked about the blood covenant that was established in chapter 15, uh, that was made between Abram and God, that there were certain stipulations, you know, I will do such and such. Do you remember um, what Abram was supposed to do? Do you have any rem Do you have any remembrance of that uh, when God says, "I'm going to establish this covenant with you"? So, I mean, what instructions so far has Abraham received from God? What are his responsibilities? When we first meet Abraham and God, he's telling him, "Leave your father's house uh, and go to the place that I will show you." Do you have any instructions there aside from just leave? I don't think there was any instructions there. Um, it was a promise. It was more of a promise, you know. I mean, he told him to leave. He said, go ahead and, you know, get out of here. Go to the place that I'm showing you. So that wasn't exactly a commandment regarding how to behave or something. Uh, can you think of any commandments or instructions that, that God has given to Abraham that he is supposed to uphold until this point? The only thing that we really have is in, in chapter 15, it says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. What does that tell you? Faith. Salvation comes by faith. <laughs> yeah, it starts with faith. And I think the fruition of that, the, the belief is that I said in, your, in you, the seed, this mm -hmm. promised seed, mm -hmm. And so he get, makes this promise, and the belief is, comes later when he offers up Isaac on the altar saying, I believe yeah. what you said. Right. Yeah, that, that faith is mm -hmm. going to be tested at that point. But before he did anything, it says he believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So we know that faith, a basic root faith, is the cause, the initial cause of everything. It has to progress from there. But the only instruction really is seems to be implied, like the first of the Ten Commandments. I am Yehovah your Elohim. What is the commandment there? Believe it. <laughs> it. You know, that's what it is. 
then it's the same thing here. We don't really have any instructions that have been given to Abraham up until this point, except for the implied one of believe what I say and do it. So, but no explicit instructions. Here is the first time where we get some instructions. When it says in the first one from I am El Shaddai, mm -hmm. I, on my app I cannot click on I am, and I thought that was also something that is that really in your version as well? Yes, or? Ani. Yeah, Ani. Okay. I am, right. And you know, it is that the you, same verbiage as the I am the I am? That's no. that is not. It is okay. not. That is hey, hey vehi. I think it's vehi, where he says I am that I am when he's talking to Moses by the burning yeah. bush. It's a diff little bit of a different word. This is more of a first person singular. That I am is more of a, an exist. Yeah. yeah. More of an existence. It's I like was. A, I will be. I am. That's and you see yeah. That I think mirrored in the side when he says the one who was. Who was, who is, and who is coming. I yeah. think that encompasses the I right. am. That's my Right, thought. agreed, absolutely. So now that the faith pattern has been established, and he believes God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, it's not long, 13 years later, he's going to appear, and he's going to give some instructions. He's going to expand this blood covenant that he, that, remember some of the elements that we talked about with the blood covenant being established, the exchange of names and such like that. You notice here that a hey is added to Abraham's name, and he is now Abraham instead of Abram. Sarai is now called Sarah, and it is the uh, covenant and the promises are now fully extended to her. It is now identified she will bear the child. You, it will come from you, and it will come from her. The ex this is all expanded. There are more instructions given. He's now saying, walk before me and be perfect, unblemished, undefiled. I'm going to give my covenant. So what I want to do is I want to take just a couple of minutes to review who's got which part of the agreement here. What are the, and God, you know, Moses lays it out for us really clearly, really clearly. In verse 4, as for me, mm -hmm. behold, and then down here, as for you, in verse 9. Basically laying it out really nicely for us. As for you, in, as for me, in verse 4, and then as for you, in verse 9. Here's my part, this is what I'm going to do, and here's your part, this is what you're going to do. So we know, first of all, that God identifies what his part is. And I'm kind of pulling back a little bit into what the promises are that he's made in the previous discussions that they've had. Number one is that he will be the father of many nations. Is Abraham the father of many nations? Yeah. Yeah. Now he is. He is right now. Not in the story just yet, but did the prophecy come true? Is he a father of many nations? Yes. Can you name any of them? Almost. Hmm? Well, not quite. No, there's a bunch that came from Shem and or from Ham and, and Japheth. But who are the who are the nations that came from Abraham? Israel is the Israelite nation. That's one. The the Ishmael, the, the Arabs, the Midianites. Mm -hmm. Midian. Remember that he has a third wife yeah. named Keturah, mm -hmm. who bears a whole oh, slew of kids. Remember the last time we talked about these other children, Ishmael, Dedan, uh, Midian, all these other children from these other women are perhaps representative of the dust of the earth? And then Edom, Esau would be also. Yeah. So there's plenty of nations that have come from Abram. And you can, you know, the rabbis rec uh, recognize Edom as Rome. I don't know what... Because Rome is identified with red, I don't or know. Russia that, too. Uh, yeah, you're, <laughs> you're going to hear all kinds of weird things out there. I don't know whether Edom became some other nation. Who knows? There's, there's really no way to tell. But did Abraham's seed become nations? Yes, absolutely, multitudes of nations, just like he said. And Israel is the chosen nation. That's the special one. 
but he's got all these other descendants as well. And I think that that is representative of, I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth, mm -hmm. earthly, fleshly. So then we have two seeds. And we mm -hmm. have two seeds. Do not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seeds. That's or right. The produce, the fruit, that's your right. Will be defiled. And even some of the people who come from the seed of Isaac, who are representative of his chosen covenant people, are more like dust of the earth. Yeah. And that might also be representative of what we looked at in chapter 15, where the birds of prey came down on these carcasses and Abraham had to drive them away. Mm -hmm. These are infiltrators, interlopers. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is perhaps representative of the kingdom of our adversary infiltrating the kingdom of heaven and masquerading like sheep, but they're actually wolves. It's very, very common. Tracy? So that's why we must come by the spiritual seed, because right. she says, Sarah, that he's not will not be heir with my with my son. So we're that's looking right. at the spiritual seed and the flesh seed. Yep. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Right. They will not be heirs. That's so we right. need to have the flesh or yep. I'm sorry, the word, the spirit. Yeah. This, and Paul spends seed. a lot of time talking about that in, in the later chapters of the book of Romans, uh, which we discussed a couple of years ago or a year ago. Angela? Oh, with what Tracy just said, and we're about to talk about cutting off the flesh. Yes, yes we are. Exactly. This is all tied this together. Totally and, you know, in relation to what Tracy just said, uh, well, I'll hold on to that thought for just a sec. Um, so, yes, he made the promise of a father of many nations, exceedingly fruitful. We can, that is demonstrable. The children whom he had from his various wives are exceedingly fruitful. No question about that. Um, produce kings through you. Well, that seems self-explanatory. There have been many kings in Israel. There have also been some great kings. I mean, King David, King Solomon, these are glorious kings. Mm -hmm. uh, so also a few others in the line of David who were really good kings. Hezekiah, you know, some good, some good kings there who are good representative examples. And, of course, there's kings from all these, uh, some of these other nations who have come from, from his descendants. So, yes, he made many kings come through. Um, he says he's going to establish an everlasting covenants with your descendants, but only those ones that are delineated through Isaac, the spiritual seed. And we'll have to distinguish that in a few minutes. But yes, he's going to establish his everlasting covenant. And he will be your God and the God of your descendants. That's a really powerful statement. What do you think that that means? What does it mean that he is your God? that he is promising to be the God of the descendants. What purpose does a God serve? Why do people need gods? Why do people make up gods? We know they're all fake, right? I mean, we, just like Paul said, we know there are many gods in the world, but there's really only one. Why do people invent gods? What are they for? Keith? So they can... So they can attribute all the blessings and goodness in their life to something. Even even the heathen do that when they they would worship the god to ask for things, and then when it came, they could credit the god. Sure. And I, it's kind of funny. I always thought that you know the god of fortune is probably uh, early times uh, atheists. Like, that just right. happened. <laughs> this is the god of fortune. <laughs> I make a joke. Sorry, John. No, I'm just. Oh, I thought you had something to say prior Wasn't to that. Is the God of Fortune called God? Well, yes, God or Gad. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's no vowel pointing. We don't know if it's God or Gad. That's why some in the Hebrew Roots community would really become upset if they don't want you to use the word God. There you go with that. Um, so, yeah, you're right, uh, Keith, that it's basically trying to point out that uh, we've got to give some type of credence to some supernatural force uh, to give credit to where they think credit is due. And we need to do the same for our God because he is actually a true God. Uh, so those are, and then of course we have the promise regarding the land that he gives. So there's some tremendous, tremendous promises here. And we also know that there are spiritual aspects of each of these promises. And that's a whole separate issue, but we'll probably come to that soon. Uh, Can I ask you please. 
I was just thinking from what I mistakenly said when you, we all are from Abraham, and mm. from we had Lot as well. I totally forgot about him. Uh, who, who are those people then? Uh, the Ammonites and the Moabites? Okay. The descendants of Lot? Is yeah. that what you're talking about? Yeah. yeah, those are the Ammonites and the Moabites. Mm. Who are they are today? Uh, probably the Jordanians and maybe some Syrians, maybe some Bedouins that are on the other side of the Jordan River. But most mm -hmm. likely, it is Syrians and Jordanians. Mm. It's probably where, where Ammon and Moab are. Uh, and so in starting in verse 9, we have God saying, as for you. Mm -hmm. okay. We've, but I'm going to back up previously to include from verse 1, walk before me. That's an instruction. Number 2, be perfect. That's an instruction. Uh, number three, guard my covenant. That is in verse 10 and also in verse 9. As for you, guard my covenant. Now, what is the word guard, Tracy? Shamar. Shamar. What does it mean? Hedge about, protect, guard, keep. Absolutely. What do you think that looks like in practical terms in daily living as far as guarding the covenant? And we'll talk about what are we guarding exactly, but we'll talk to me just a little bit if anybody wants to. You know, what, how do we guard this covenant? What does it mean to... Uphold it as the most important part to live by. Uphold it as of first importance. That's a great... Protect it. Yeah. Yes. Angela? Teach it to our children. Teach it to our children. Yes. Write it on your Write it on your forehead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a you good one. I think he was being a little uh, you know, deliberate with us there as saying, Look, I want you to take this seriously. Write it on your gates, write it on your hand, on your forehead, you know, whatever you need to do. Remember it. Guard it. Well, I think that's more it. of a representation of the mind because we see that again when he says well, the, this, what he will do by his spirit is he will write his Torah on the hearts and minds. Mm. So that's, that's our, our, our mind is our, what we think with and our hands is what we work with. Right. So that's like that's that hearer only or a hearer and a doer. So right. We got to do both. So if right. Abraham had just heard this and believed, well then when it came time to offer up Isaac, his faith would have, would have been dead because it would have been without works. Sure, sure. Carla? Um, to, like, prevent it from being changed. Yes. Or um, done away with. Yes, great insight, absolutely. Guard as in don't touch it, mm -hmm. don't change it, make sure it is perpetuated, guard it in your own life, guard it in your children, very, very important. I know I, there are so many times in the Torah when it's taught that you will teach this to your children. It's so, so critical. And I know that my parents failed. They took me to church on Sundays and handed me over to the Sunday school teacher, and that was it. That was not guarding the covenant. That was, that's, it's hard to guard the covenant. You have to set aside time yeah. to spend with your children and talk to them about it. Uh, and protect I, you know, it from others, too. Yeah, protect it from others. They do that violence is, to my law. Absolutely, yeah, very, very true. Angela? Um, I just I wish that we had more time tonight because I know what what's coming next. <laughs> um, and actually, I'm excited to talk about circumcision. <laughs> <laughs> and and Tracy, you know, she just mentioned the hearts and thighs. And just remember next week when we talked about guarding the covenant and those how eyes and lips and ears coming into this and fruit and fields that all of this is linked to circumcision. Absolutely. And let that be your little cliffhanger for next week. Oh, that yeah. This is all related to circumcision. It's not just a... Very it's true. It's not what you think it is. It is not. It's not next week. Are we not next week, no. Oh, she yeah. missed. Yeah. She misspoke yeah, the week, the week after that. Yeah. Sorry. Has more to do with I know. Underbody. I will post it. But you know what? You're, you're right. It is getting a little bit late, and I... Um, this next part dealing with circumcision is rather complicated. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mike. I just wanted to point out too that um, when you guard that word, that it all 
also guards you. Yeah. So it's that same idea that we had a little while back about the shield. Right. That it's really only good as long as you're behind it. Sure. Right. So sure. as you take care of that covenant and, and, and that word, it takes care of you. Well. Absolutely. It's absolutely mutually beneficial. Very true. Tracy? It says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. And, right. Um, I made a meme a while ago. <clears throat> because that word shamar, one of the definitions was to hedge about as with thorns. Like mm -hmm. that's something that's going to keep something protected, keep things out. And it's just that imagery of Messiah wearing that crown of thorns on his head to protect you. And he says, if you love me, protect my commandments. Very good. Very good. So I want to just, I want to just briefly point out That's two things. Are, yeah. I want to point out two things and then we'll wrap up really quick. Number one, in regard to this, I would make a note for yourself. Verse 11 says, circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. Look that up. Do a little research into that. And I, want to t I will tell you that the word foreskin is not there in the Hebrew. That word foreskin does not even exist as a Hebrew word. There's definitely a word there. But it's not... It's it does not mean what you think it means? Or law. It does not mean what you think it means. So do a little research and look into that, this thing about or law. And it's feminine. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So I want you to look at <laughs> verse 11, because when we get together next time, we're going to be talking about circumcision. And it's really, really fascinating, because we do have a couple of Hebrew words here which are just drop-dead amazing. Circumcise and foreskin. Very interesting Hebrew words which do not mean what you think they mean. And as one final little tidbit, did you notice that God appeared to Abraham and he immediately dropped on his face? That he began to speak with him and Abraham fell on his face? And what does that imply? Worship. Worship. Worship is always described as someone gets down on their knees or with their face to the ground. Notice also that when he said Sarah is going to bear a child, that he again fell down on his face. What do you think is coming? When you at the beginning see he fell on his face, oh. and at the end you see he fell on his face, what can you suspect? There is a chiasm here. Here is the chiasm. In verse 3, Abraham fell on his face. In verse 17, Abraham fell on his face. In verse 4, Abraham is changed to multitude of nations. In verse 16, Sarah is changed to mother of nations. Nice. In verse... Uh, uh, five, Abram's name is changed to Abraham. In verse 15, Sarai's name is changed to Sarah. In verse 6, there's this strange Hebrew word there that says, ye shall become fruitful. And in verse 14, the root is the same, different word, same root. This is for one who does not circumcise himself, he has invalidated my covenant. Very interesting. Look into that. In verse 7, an eternal covenant is spoken of. In verse 13, an eternal covenant is spoken of. Verses 7 through 8, there's a mini chiasm. I will be your God. I will give you the land. I will be your God. Verses 11 through 12, another mini chiasm on the other side of center phrase. Circumcision, sign, circumcision. And verses 9 through 10 are right in the center. What does verses 9 and 10 say? 
I'll totally include this slide in the presentation for those of you who want it. Keep my covenant, you and your seed, after you and your generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your seed after you, and every man child among you shall be circumcised. So which is very interesting, and we'll talk a lot more about that next time. This is not only the covenant, this is also the sign of the covenant. Circumcision is both the covenant itself and the sign of the covenant. Right, because he says if you don't do it, you're not keeping the covenant. That's right. So there you go. Look at this whole... <laughs> yeah, don't, don't go making a doctor's appointment. <laughs> yeah, hold off until you make that doctor's appointment until we talk next time. Uh, but circumcision, fascinating, fascinating stuff. Look into it. Check out this chiasm. And then let's get together next time and we'll do some, some heavy duty lifting on what is circumcision and do you need to be circumcised to be saved? And the answer is an unequivocal yes. <laughs> no. Spiritually. <laughs> which seed, which seed are we talking about? <laughs> That's right. Let us first.